So anyway, um, what I was saying before was review of last time. So we also talked about process. We didn't just talk about equipment. We talked about making sure that your processes were standardized and so that they were repeatable. We talked about, um, uh, in addition, we also talked about how to troubleshoot results. So you know what's happening out there if you're not getting uh, the results that you wanted. And again, all this information is available on the video online. It should be out in about a week, and it's all available uh, on. All of our quick guides, and and and, uh, and of course, you always we always have a um, customer support that I think uh, uh, Dave Dave Thornton uh, mentioned. Uh, thank you, Dave, for thanking us uh, for, about before. So, um, but there was something that we actually well, kind of missed last time, and I wanted to bring it up this time, and that is about our panels, about our panels and our frames. So the, the frame and the panel construction and the installation can actually make a difference for your accuracy. So um, I wanted to quickly, if uh, guys, if I, have, if I have a chance, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the hard frame panel, and I wanted to talk about some of the older aluminum frames with the standard construction, and I wanted to talk a little bit about the new RetroTech aluminum frame. So one rule of thumb that that's, you know, is that all standards are most standards, um, no matter how specific they are, and it doesn't, I'm not just talking about residential standards, but um, they require that the blower door panel be uh, leakier than the existing door that that panel is actually in. Okay, so you're going to put it in some kind of door, some kind of, some kind of window, some kind of opening in the shell. So very, uh, so as a rule of thumb, I'm not, I say the word, word I say the term rule of thumb because I'm not, Certain, and again, this is my opinion, but I've never seen one that asks that the blower door panel be uh, that the blower door panel be uh, tighter than the existing door. And these three panels were actually developed with the idea that they would fit into three sort of typical doorways. So they would be, you know, equal to or or, or partially leakier than that doorway. The first one um, is the poorly weather stripped uh, doorway, which would have approximately about a sixteenth inch gap. Um, which would equate to about 14 square inches total of leakage when that door is actually, that real door is shut. There's a second door that's a well weather stripped and adjusted door that might be around, say, three square inches of leakage when it's when it's shut and it's it's operating in, in natural conditions. And then there is a, uh, a super tight door that might be as tight as, say, one square inch, but possibly more. So another rule of thumb to sort of apply to that is the idea that uh, a door panel, if a door panel is, is uh, leakage is about 10% of the total leakage that you're testing, then you definitely need to, uh, you need further investigation. But if it's less than that, you probably don't need to. But um, the reason why we bring this up, and I want to get into this a little bit more detailed, but is the fact that um, the testers really should learn how leaky their panels are in advance of any tests that they do. Uh, it can be very important. In fact, uh, uh, one, one example of why this is so important is going to be uh, something that I think uh, uh, Colin said, right? Colin, Colin was explaining that he has, uh, in the past, he's performed tests in nuclear power plants where every part of the test needed to be documented, even the, the panel leaks including. And, and he said that uh, you know learning how much the panels leak is was very very useful. It was actually super important, um, so that you can determine you know what they how they were affecting his results, and, and it can be if, if important to anybody else. So um, let's talk a little bit specifically about these panels, so you know what to expect and and how to plan for for leakage with them, if that's okay with you. Is that okay with everybody? Okay. Everybody I added can... a Jay, I added a slide for you that shows the older aluminum panel versus the new one that's mm -hmm. coming up for you. Okay, awesome. I, hopefully, I've got the right presentation up. I'm switched between computers. I don't even know what. I'm just I'm just talking out of my out of my brain here, out of my heart, folks. I love you. But uh, all joking aside, um, the hard panels are built for about are designed for about a thousand CFM at 50 Pascal. So that's right about I think the max that they that that they're designed for. Um, hard panels are used to measure flows well in excess of, of 2,000. But uh, the panel leakage is, is irrelevant. Uh, is not irrelevant. Uh, it's irrelevant, but in, in tight rooms. So sorry, let me rephrase that. When the hard panels are used to measure flows in excess of 2,000, the panel leakage is, is irrelevant. 
um, but in tight rooms where uh, or tight uh, you know tight structures, uh, it could make a difference between pass or fail. So uh, the door leakage uh, may be a major part of the total leakage and, and cannot just be deducted or just uh, blown off. So attention needs to be paid to the door panel leakage. Um, if the flow rate is under what you might want to measure, um, the panel tightness, you might want to compare the, the panel tightness to the door tightness and subtract uh, any access from those readings. Um, let's talk about the aluminum frame and cloth. So this is sort of the, oh thanks. So um, this is what Joe was talking about. Um, these were sort of, um, I lost the slide. This is not a picture of the original aluminum frame. This is the current aluminum frame. This is actually a, a frame that is a prototype for passive house. Um, but it does really apply to our discussion of frame leakage. Why? Because you'll notice, obviously, this is a frame that's intended to be used as a blower door because it's on the outer shell of the, of the structure of the building. But it's using, but there's two things that are different. Obviously, one, anybody want to guess what the first thing they, they notice that's different about this blower door using your, 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 your question panel? What's, the, what's probably the most obvious thing that's different? Oh, Scott, absolutely spot on. Scott, I was expecting someone to say it's a duct tester, but Scott nailed it. It's actually a 300 series. Yeah, it's a smaller fan. It's, it's actually a duct tester. So passive houses are very, very, very tight. Uh, in fact, uh, they're, I, I believe it's 0 .06 ACH, right? Is that is that right? I think so. But the point yeah. is that... Right. Thank you. So the point is that uh, we can we can test we can test that f fairly easily with the with the 340 series with the 300 series because it does have a uh, it goes up to a right around I think 800 cfm um, and as low as 0 0.04 cfm. Um, but the other thing is that this frame is extremely small. Um, this frame fits into a window. Well, there's doors in passive houses. There's not just windows. But the reason is that we want to make sure that that contact point of the frame to uh, from the, the blower door frame to the to the window or to the outside, essentially the shell itself, it, uh, provides as little opportunity for leakage as possible. So that in combination with our newer frames, these aluminum frames with these snap together co corners and the cloth cover, um, these are actually far more tight. In fact, these can be so tight um, they might even give you a, uh, an unrealistic re um, uh, reading of how tight the actual door would be. So this one is uh, is about uh, designed for about 70 cfm at at 50 pascal. So it, it, outside of that, no attention or below that, unless you're below that 70 cfm, no attention really needs to be paid to the door panel leakage. Um, if the flow rate is is under that, then yeah, you should definitely measure the panel tightness compared to the door tightness, and and then subtract any any excess from the readings. Um, and again, I can, can explain that if you really want to, but the, you know, I, I, I basically you're going to run the blower door at a different door, and then compare the difference between the doors, and then you probably should have about the uh, about the ex the excess of, of leakage from that door. Um, point is uh, that you you don't really need to worry about it, uh, especially uh, if if uh, with this new frame. If you're looking for for if for accurate tests, sometimes the the super tight frame is not as accurate because you might be testing a leakier door. Um, does that make sense to everybody? So yeah, these ones I don't know if anybody's seen these before. Um, they just snap together. It's easy as easy as one, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> Little inside joke, and. Uh, and they, they're very tight. The gaskets are very tight. They fit well inside the door. The actual cloth panel is uh, can yeah, fits tightly enough so that yeah can provide us with uh, as little as uh, about one to about three square inches of leakage, which is nominal. All right. So that kind of goes over um, what we talked about last week, what we didn't talk about last week. Um, the one thing that I did want to mention um, that we probably should mention that we talked about last week was we also talked a little bit about um, what comes out of this whole calibration system of, of or I'm sorry, what comes out when you actually find out that you need to calibrate, when you actually find out, or when you have a, a new piece of equipment, how you know that it's calibrated to be uh, to be accurate. So Retrotech has a calibration certificate. I think Joe's going to talk a little bit more about um, where those uh, Joe and sorry Joe and Colin are going to talk about how we actually uh, how we devise this and how we 
uh, how we assess the fact that that a, that a piece of equipment is accurate. But I want to show you uh, really quickly um, this cer this certificate. Um, this will come with your equipment when you buy it new, um, and we do, uh, uh, you know, some some states, some municipalities do actually ask for this, although I'm told it's not that common. But we 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 make sure that we calibrate our equipment anyway. So digital pressure gauges and test fans are calibrated separately. So you're going to have separate certificates or, or separate uh, um, listings uh, uh, for or certifications for the gauge and the fan. Um, the fan calibration must be verified every four years. Now we talked extensively about this last week. That that's not necessarily that that you're asked to do that, but really uh, it, you can very very easily figure out using the the process that we talked about before. You can figure out pretty easily it, whether or not your equipment needs to be calibrated, and uh, and uh, the actual digital gauge itself, um, you know, only about every five years uh, needs to be calibrated. Does that sound right? Anybody out there? No, have any different information, right? And so, a little bit of detail here. Um, the RetroTech right now is is working to to build their own uh, t testing and calibration uh, facility and equipment um, that will. Uh, we've already had our our first. Uh, uh, we've already had our first inspection of, of ISO one seven zero two five two zero zero five. Um, and that is an accreditation. So we have, uh, I was told, uh, talked to Ben yesterday, who's a RetroTech uh, guy working on the back end, and he said that we should, uh, our inspector is coming back um, in February, probably first week of February, and we should have um, our accreditation um, by the uh, by the end of February. So Terry says, yeah, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers actually require the gauge. Okay, so I'm going to chime in here, Jay. So uh, one of the things I want to try and do is uh, alter some of our webinars to be more like a moderated discussion. So um, Colin's on the line also, and um, he um, you know, lives and breathes and eats this stuff all the time. So I thought that Colin might be able to just highlight a little bit about um, uh, what RedTrack is doing, because we do actually have a whole calibration process that's you know, um, very sophisticated. But this is a whole other level um, that I know that uh, Europe uh, is requiring. So Colin, do you want to... Uh, Elaborate on the new uh, certification that we're pursuing. Yeah, is my is my microphone working? Uh, yeah, you sound a little far away from your computer. Maybe just lean in a little bit. Okay, uh, I'm actually working on my headset. How's is that any better? Yes, thank you. Okay, so there's a couple of things I wanted to clarify. Uh, the one is that Jay said we don't have a calibration facility, which is not true. We actually have four ASTM calibration chambers. Uh, there is no ISO requirement for uh, ISO certification in uh, North America. We've never been asked for it in over 32 years. However, we are being asked for it in Europe. So the uh, chambers that we have are built to ISO standards, but uh, getting accreditation is another thing, and we doubt whether anybody in the U.S. will ever ask for that. However, all the calibrations that we do now and all the calibrations that we will be doing for units being sold in the U.S., are being done in uh, what are known as ASTM calibration chambers. Um, the certificate that was shown on the screen is actually a special certificate that somebody would ask for, um, and it's something that we charge for, uh, where we calibrate the fan on three uh, on each range at three different back pressures and at three different flow rates: minimum, middle, and maximum. Uh, we've only been asked for that calibration in the U.S. three times in 31 years, uh, just to put it in perspective. So it's not something that we anticipate that people will be asking for. Um, the little graph that is on the screen, um, was just on the screen a minute ago, uh, is part of the calibration that we do, uh, the rigorous calibration that we do on each fan when we first manufacture it to make sure we fully understand exactly how the calibration changes with respect to uh, different pressures and different flow rates, different back pressures. Um, I have another slide that shows well over a thousand points, I think it's that one there, well over a thousand calibration points where we've done the calibration at different back pressures from zero all the way up to 250 pascals with different uh, devices on the front end and the back end with flex ducts attached to the back end, the front end, and so on. 
to see how it moves to calibration all over the place. Uh, to put this in perspective, there is equipment out there where this hasn't been done on, and these differences can make huge, uh, or I should say these changes in calibration can make huge differences in the performance of the equipment so that when we add things like flux ducts and so on to the front of the fans, the calibrations can be thrown off by 10, 15 percent. So what we're doing here is we are experimenting with uh, a new style of device, which is our Model 300, that is very capable of being used in a variety of roles, both testing houses and testing ducts in pressurized and depressurized. Um, so that you have a very versatile piece of equipment. This particular piece of equipment we feel is probably around five times more accurate than anything else you can get on the market when you're looking at a very diverse and wide range of applications. So it's actually a pretty cool um, way of taking care of the calibration issue, meaning with this particular device you can do almost anything with it and get away with it. Um, that was all I really had to say, except there was one slide. You had two slides back. I don't know if you can back up there, which is pretty important. And it shows uh, UJ actually taking the red tube out of the back of the panel, taking it over a hand railing and down. Uh, there it is right there. Uh, what that tends to do is because the tube is actually in the air, when the fan is blowing or even when the wind is blowing, that tube will move around and cause the pressure that is being measured across the house to jump around all over the place. And to simulate that, you can simply uh, put a red tube uh, on the back end of your gauge and wobble it back and forth, just like it might in the wind, and you'll see the pressure in that gauge fluctuate by 5, 10, 15, maybe even 20 pascals. Really important to keep that tube on the ground, keep it stable, keep it so it's not dangling around in the air. So just wanted to make sure that everyone knew that. So over to you guys. Thank you. Um, so Joe, did you have anything you wanted to add to that or any other questions? Uh, no, I've got a few slides that I'll, I can uh, bring in and talk about the, the more about the fans or the assembly and that kind of stuff. So. Uh, I, you know, we were talking a minute ago about um, you know who's actually requiring the uh, they have their fans calibrated um, and uh, kind of confirming whether they are or not. So um, just as the gauge, you know, that we kind of feel unless somebody's requiring that paperwork, that if you're checking your fan regularly, um, then you know it's not something we require to have you sent back or send back in. So uh, it isn't the goal to try and um, you know keep dinging people for you know, more calibrations when it's really not uh, a requirement. So um, let me go ahead and bring in my uh, uh, set of slides here. I'm going to bring this up now. Okay, I do uh, not have a second um, uh, computer running, so if I drop away, then um, hopefully somebody else can uh, grab the range. So um, uh, I'm actually out in Louisiana, so if anybody's out there in Louisiana, uh, chime in and say hello. Um, Louisiana is joining the uh, family of uh, of uh, energy code, and um, I'm actually at a Coburn uh, supply, and uh, they've been incredibly gracious and uh, helping me this week to go out and uh, work with a lot of their their family that they do, and uh, uh, they've embraced the code as a state more than any place I've ever seen. So um, they kind of uh, not only accept their destiny, but they actually have embraced it and done well with um, what the requirements. So I really appreciate what they're doing out here. So I got a pop quiz for you for those of you that have a uh, DM32. This is the quiz. I try to like uh, add some illustrations on top of it to see if uh, you know to create the quiz that I wanted. So one of the things that changed in the the last few versions of the DM32 was that this little device here, which everybody uh, usually familiar with as a duct tester, can be a duct tester or also a blower door. So um, I, my quiz here would say does, um, this is the actual range 74 in the rule device on the right, but does anybody else see an, a, an issue or a challenge with what I actually have on the gauge? So I tried to zoom in so you could see what it looked like. So that is the correct range. The Pascals, everything is uh, running as it should be. The CFM is all normal. So if anybody out there wants to take our quiz and say, oh, I can see what your problem is, um, then uh, you're welcome to do so now or as we go. So. I'll come back to this slide towards the end. Um, I do want to also make sure people were aware of, I know it was in the uh, title slide in the beginning, 
Uh, but we do have our multi-fan training coming up. So at the end, I'll kind of remind you about that and what that is. So I just want to make sure we, we get a plug in to remind people that's coming up. If you want to go to retrotech.com and learn more about it. So the 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 duct tester, right? It's the easiest one to kind of talk about in terms of what's been changing uh, lately and significantly uh, at Retrotech. And uh, if you have one that's kind of got the square edges, you have a Q32. It's an older model. Uh, you could have one that's the uh, the DU200, it's an identical frame, and now they have the 300 or the 341 where they actually have a DC motor. Um, the entire front is a change in terms of how it actually reads the pressures, uh, DC motor, variable speed, a variety of great improvements. Um, but I thought I'd let uh, Colin explain as to what are some of the design features and how he um, went with the single body shell. and about their uh, the calibration uh, concept that they have here in the uh, center picture with the red. Colin, you want to describe your the evolution of your duct tester? Well, what's really cool about this device <clears throat> is that all of the parts on the front end that you can see on the right two slides are all injection molded, and we're the only product on the market that's made like that. Uh, we used to make them vacuum formed where we have a tolerance of maybe plus minus 25 thousandths of an inch. Now we're down to plus minus one or two thousandths of an inch, which means that the um, reliability, or not the reliability, but repeatability from one unit to the other is getting very, very, very close. So uh, the, the other thing that we can do with this, which is really cool, is we're, we've been running through calibrations on it for the last three months. We're actually able to determine differences in flow by as little as one thousandth of a CFM. That's 0 .001 CFM. Um, we've got leakage in the fan shell body that's down in that range of a few thousandths of a CFM, which uh, will literally give us the ability to test a, a keyhole or uh, less than a pinhole if we want to, and then go all the way up to testing out. So we think that this will open up some new uh, potential uh, applications for us, um, which could be kind of cool. It would allow us to test an electrical outlet on the wall and see just how significant or insignificant an outlet is compared to, to the leakage of an entire house. The other thing it has um, is a very lightweight uh, DC impeller that is powered by a computer power supply which enables us to actually run it on batteries. So we could run this unit on batteries um, uh, it's universal, run on anything from 90 to 280 volts, uh, any frequency. So it has some uh, incredible features that uh, we think will start to revolutionize our industry. Uh, the other thing you'll notice on the right-hand side is there's the plug that mounts over the hole, and that plug can be exchanged for a series of different plugs that go from what uh, we call range 74 which is actually in, in millimeters, so it's about a three-inch hole. And range 74 is what you'd use for testing leaky ducts, although that's range 47, relatively tighter ducts. goes all the way down to a range 1, which is, uh, I think, uh, 20 thousandths of a CFM. So we have a very uh, wide-ranging instrument that, uh, and no one's ever made anything like this. And a big part of it is the fact that we use all injection molded parts that are extremely accurate. Over to you, Joe. Um, one of the other features is um, the ability for their fans, um, and I'm going to bring you back to elaborate on your blower door and how that you do that, is that the, the fan and the smart gauges that Richard Tech has developed um, all allow you to turn the fan around. So here, yeah, I can pressurize or depressurize depending on where I add the flex uh, duct that connects to the, uh, to the return. But if I wanted to uh, swap it around and go from pressurization to depressurization or vice versa, it's simply a matter of um, separating the flex, spin the fan around. There's nothing to add, nothing to change. All of the cable and tubing all stays the same. And uh, that's because they have uh, uh, set it up so that they're actually referencing and reading pressures on both sides of the fan. So you can see on the, on the side over here where my mouse is, that there's a green and a yellow tube. Um, so no matter which way you're testing, you have the ability to uh, to read that. So um, the blower door does the same. So uh, I don't have to um, rearrange or adjust a bunch of tubing um, if I wanted to actually do a pressurization test of the blower door because they had uh, issues or concerns with uh, bringing in contaminants. I can just flip the fan around, uh, hit set, 
uh, 5 uh, for pressure and go, and it knows um, which way the fan is. Uh, Colin, you want to elaborate on how you set that up? You know, what, well, the fan itself. Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of cool because it's got two flow chambers in there, and I guess all the user really needs to know is that the fan is smart enough to work in any configuration. So in the old style of fan, what you'd have to do is when you were, uh, like let's say with a blower door configuration, you'd have to run a reference tube outside. Um, you may have to add an extra tube when you're pressurizing or depressurizing and I find being forgetful that I forget to put that tube on or forget to take it off. And by having to put the reference tube on or having to take it off, you can uh, cause some pretty large errors, like easily 15, 20, 30, 40 percent. Uh, you can even take data, which is totally meaningless. Uh, so we've tried to make it uh, idiot-proof, if you pardon the expression. So pretty much whatever you do with this, whether you stick a duct over the end or you put an adapter over the end or whatever, the, the unit is always smart enough to figure out what you're doing and to give you the right result. Uh, the other cool thing uh, in the design of this uh, on the second picture from the right is our flow unit. Yeah, I got a bad and detail for you. Is this what you're looking for? Taken apart here. It only took us two years to figure out how to do this exactly. but. Um, Oh yeah, one cool thing about it is that if you happen to get something inside the unit, like uh, suck up some old cigarette butts or uh, a, a small animal goes inside it or something, uh, or a piece of paper toweling or something kind of flip, flip, flipping around, you can actually take the thing apart because it's held together with a very special tape and incidentally, they use tape to hold airplanes together, so it's, there's, there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, there's a very special tape, and you get an entire roll of this, so you can actually disassemble your duct tester and take it apart and vacuum it out if something gets inside it and put it back together using that same tape. So you can actually see right inside your unit if you have to, so you don't have to set it back to the factory if it gets full of water or something happens to it. Over to you, Joe. Oh, there's it. So the there's the ring on the side is where you can see um, how you can take off this entire unit on the front. So not just the plugs or the the open configuration for the range, but um, you can see here this uh, the unit I have in the center is actually this unit here on the edge, and this is the tape that Colin's referring to. You can take that apart and clean it off, or have access for a variety of stuff on the inside. So that was really what he was referring to. Um, Colin mentioned this, and I asked him when we were kind of talking about doing some webinars about the gray area. And um, I don't, I don't think I'd be exaggerating when I said that Jay, myself, and many other uh, listeners out there, this is the one part of our industry that kind of is not really stressed, focused on, or talked about is the calibration of the fan or the fan itself, or how that happens, how it works, uh, what goes behind it. Um, everybody's really focused on the gauge and a variety of other stuff, how you set up, where you put your tubing. Um, and uh, I, I know this slide was up a second ago, but I really wanted Colin to kind of elaborate as to how does he take these, um, you know, enormous amount of data points. And then he actually calculates the curve that becomes a formula that he puts into the gauge. And uh, to me, it's just kind of like mind-blowing as to uh, what's behind uh, the system. So it isn't just like the gauge says, oh, give me some numbers and I can actually do that automatically. It's not actually a uh, electronics, uh, it's actually a formula that's been built in obviously. So Colin, you want to kind of elaborate as to how you take this enormous amount of data and create a, uh, and this is just one of the ranges or the plugs um, for the uh, 340 or 341. Uh, sure, yeah, we, we've taken a ridiculous amount of data to see how this performs under every condition. It's the kind of thing that if you, if you don't know and you don't look, you kind of assume that everything is great. But when you start taking a really close look at how a system performs over its entire range, you find all kinds of bubbles that uh, you know maybe you didn't know were there. It's quite easy for a piece of equipment to be calibrated at a specific point and be 100% um, accurate at one point, but to have it be accurate over a wide range of points is actually much more difficult. So what this shows here is uh, serial number 199, 273, and 283 all have uh, a whole series of different tests done on them. 
they're also done on different uh, flow measurement devices, and there's actually a difference between the devices themselves. It's very difficult to get a flow measurement device that's much better than 3.5%. So the ASTM nozzles that most people use to calibrate fans, uh, I just looked at one from uh, Korea last night. It's about a $150,000 unit that measures up to 10 CFM. And they advertise 3.5% accuracy. Well, the LFEs that we use in here are, by and large, within about one quarter to one half a percent uh, accurate. So they're really, really accurate, which is uh, the reason why we can get such great results. But what we're seeing here is a difference from one fan to the next. Um, and every fan's going to be a little bit different. We've also been able to determine very, very small differences in the calibration plate that we put on there. And uh, we are now in the process of making minor adjustments so we can get most of our calibrations to within less than 1% over the entire range. This is the first time where we've actually been able to adjust calibration. And this is true for everyone's equipment. Its calibration is actually determined by the size of the hole. So we now have a means of making adjustments to those hole sizes so we can get all these points within a percent. Now, to put this in perspective, if you were to take a typical duct tester and put it on here, I wouldn't be surprised if you would see points in the calibration curve that were off by 10, 15, or even 20 percent. I've seen them over 30 percent. So uh, this is about 10 times more accurate than what we've seen so far. Uh, the tools, the automated tools we have for checking this calibration over its range, and here the x-axis is the flow signal, and the, um, yeah, the x-axis is the flow signal, so all the way from lowest flows to highest flows, and in the y-axis, error from calibration is the difference in the calibration curve. So here we've done calibrations also, if you look at the very first one, um, like the number 2014-10-1321 is actually the year, month, day, hour, and minute that it was calibrated on. The next one is the serial number, then the back pressure was calibrated on, and then the device that was doing the calibration. So you can see that even though we have uh, a wide range of results, we've got a wide range of back pressures from 0 to 250 pascals, which is wider than what we would ever use in North America, we still are well within about 1 or 2 percent uh, over most of the range. So it's actually pretty cool. Um, we've been working on this now for about three months, and we are going to present to the industry a whole new um, era of calibration that uh, is going to be probably about five times better than we've seen so far. So probably the last thing you'll need to do is worry about calibration because we're doing all the worrying for you. Back to you. Thank you. Um, I got a quick question here, um, and I'll throw catch a column. So uh, I'll give you my uh, answer too in the process. So um, this is one of the best questions I've actually have, uh, gotten from somebody in the webinar in a while. So where should the gauge be put during a blower door test? So where should, where is it like um, set um, on the panel or in your hand or uh, I'll say it out loud on the ground? And I know that Colin is cringing right now. Um, and uh, so that the internal pressures uh, don't actually get involved with how the gauge is reading uh, those pressures. So um, I do know that uh, Regitech's um, new cloth um, frame all come with two crossbars. So there's a crossbar that holds the fan, and there's an upper crossbar that actually goes just above the little clear window so you can see outside. And uh, they have a little pouch or a little, actually, a Velcro clip that allows you to hold your uh, gauge so it's not part of the flow. Um, but for other folks who are just as a standard, if you do not have some place to clip your gauge, uh, we'll make this a universal question, then where should they be or how should they make sure they're not being affected by the flow, Colin? Well, the only thing you really have to worry about is flow velocity. Wherever you put the gauge inside the house, it's going to pick up the same pressure. Um, so it's really velocity that is going to affect it. And everybody that uh, gets one of these gauges should do a very simple test, is to pick up one of the tubes that's attached to the gauge and simply blow in it. And you'll see the gauge go up like 10, 20, 30 pascals. Very sensitive to being blown on. 
So as long as it's out of the airflow stream from the fan, you're fine. Uh, that's kind of like the main takeaway. The one I mentioned earlier is whipping the tube around. That will cause it to jump around. So you want to put the gauge in such a place where the tubes aren't moving, or the tubes are stable, and they're not kind of dangling and flopping around. And most importantly, that there is air from the fan is not hitting your gauge, maybe hitting a wall and bouncing off and coming back and hitting your gauge, and then you'll be fine. The other thing that I also add to that is that um, you need to make sure that your tubing is not in front of the fan. Because um, I see a lot of common setups um, where the gauge may be fine, but unfortunately they left their um, either the tubing that connects to the fan or the tubing that's actually their reference for outside happens to be kind of sitting right in front of the fan. And uh, uh, so it'll cause some fluctuations or errors in their reading because that um, tubing has a, a vibration that's coming from that. So it should also make sure that your tubing is also not in front of the fan uh, when you're performing your tests. All right, so this is Retrotex Calibration Chamber. We mentioned this kind of last week, but I know this is a, um, uh, a significant slide that people really always want to ask about or want to hear more about. I know that um, uh, Colin Colin mentioned that, so one of our goals was that these two webinars kind of overlapped each other. So is there uh, some things you'd like to elaborate about how our existing calibration chamber if I'm correct, is the same. We're just going to have it certified that it uh, follows the ISO standard. Is that correct, Colin? Well, the ISO certification is, I doubt if it will ever be required. Uh, we have followed the ISTM AMC, uh, uh, ISO protocol uh, in, uh, in, creating our, in creating our chamber, so it works according to that, so it's probably more than what people are asking for in North America. This particular one is the our nozzle chamber, which is used for measuring high flows. It will go up to 9,000 CFM and down to around about 200 CFM. Uh, we have another one that goes from 1,000 down to 2 CFM uh, or 1 CFM, and another one that goes from full scale maximum flow of 2 CFM down to, I think, uh, 2 tenths of a CFM. Uh, we use them for different purposes. We also have an orifice plate uh, chamber as well. It's used for certain kinds of calibration. So we've been calibrating for, well, I've been calibrating for 32 years, so I've got lots of calibration experience, uh, probably more than just about anyone on the planet, at least for what we call calibrated fans. So uh, I guess the takeaway is that uh, we pretty much got it handled, so you don't have to worry about it. Um, and I think this was also covered by Jay um, uh, last week, so I don't want to go uh, too far into it, but it is something that is part of the calibration uh, uh, in general. Uh, what I do want to cover before we um, lose track of our time is the, the quiz that we have. So if anybody, um, if you have a DM32 gauge, uh, then clearly you're like in the know about how this quiz works. If you do not have a DM32, oops, sorry, then um, it... Uh, you're like, oh, well, and you'll learn something about what the answer really is. So anybody want to take a stab as to what the, um, the answer is here? So as Jay mentioned earlier, you want to make sure you have the correct firmware on your gauge. It's crucial that uh, you keep that up to date. It's not like your uh, router or your phone, which maybe is once a year or something like that. Um, their firmwares are updated almost every month because they're adding their different devices or uh, different options or ranges or uh, a variety of stuff, even if your equipment is the same, there's always some uh, minor tweaks that can happen. So what I demonstrated here was that although we have a duct tester in terms of how we define what the unit is on the right, it can be used for a blower door or for obviously testing ducts. And in the gauge, when you hit the device where you press actually the button here to, or actually the, on the screen, you tap this area to select the device that the, one of the first screens that pops up is blower doors. And you see the, obviously the, the different blower doors as part of the RetroTech uh, family, and you also see the duct tester. And many people may not read the top that it says blower doors, pick your device, and notice that the number is says 300. And this is implying that I'm going to be doing a blower test. If I were to hit the next screen, then I actually would be on what they refer to as duct testers, and you see the 340 as an option, and then I actually would see 340 listed here. So I want to make sure that people knew that that was a change in the firmware, and the reason is is that there are different fan curves for doing a blower door versus a duct tester. So again, those are kind of things that are 
you know, um, and deep in the engineering side. So if you, can you elaborate briefly on what that difference is in terms of why would it make a difference that I'm using this for a blower door or a duct tester cone? Well, there currently is a difference in the calibration curves between the duct tester, which you can see in the graphic there. It's got a little gray duct going off the right-hand side, so you can uh, pick it up, and it should say 340, actually not 300. Um, so as long as your picture matches, you're okay. The current calibration curves, uh, with all that uh, stuff that I showed you earlier, with all those little uh, numbers floating around on the screen, uh, in future, we've been able to get all of the Model 300s, whether they be used as a load or a duct tester, to give the same results. So uh, we may actually simplify that, but the way it is right now, if you're choosing duct testing, you're choosing Model 341. If you're choosing blow door testing, you're choosing Model 300. And you can actually tell from the icon which one is which. Yeah, so there was actually a, uh, a double trick one there that the icon in the picture uh, is the duct tester, meanwhile, the number. So um, I tried to do it quickly so I could come up with a quiz. So um, I did have an error there myself, so I apologize. I'm sure everybody caught that also. Right. Um, Jay, do you have some slides you want to do as a uh, follow-up or talk about where we're headed next? Sure, yes. um, you mean uh, where we're going to be physically? Uh, yeah. Sure, absolutely. Um, I want to bring that one up. So yeah, I, there is a, uh, there's been a little bit of talk too about um, uh, on in the question in the, the question field there about let me see if I can bring this up for you about um, where to put the gauge right and I know that we did kind of talk about it but I wanted to see if I could share my screen again and this is let's see if I can do this. Right. And I wanted to talk about um, one of the uh, an example of how to uh, to deal with that. And let me just I guess <laughs> your mail. Um, <laughs> of that, of course. Um, let me change this um, screen share. So anyway, uh, the point is that uh, uh, someone had asked earlier, how's this work a little bit better? Probably not. Kind of generic. <laughs> All right. So uh, well, okay. Well, I, I got a comment while you can do that. So okay, one of the things that people uh, ask frequently is, "Oh, well, how accurate is the gauge, or how accurate is the fan?" And I know that Colin's got some, uh, you know, some uh, comment here. He'll add in a second. But uh, one of the things we try to do was, like, if your gauge was off by one percent, right? So if you did a test and you, um, for, for some reason, realized your gauge was, you know, maybe it's off by one point five percent, which could be considered unacceptable. As to what does that really do when you do a reading? What does that affect in terms of your flow or the CFM? And the reality is, is that um, on a duct test, it may make the difference of about three to worst case five CFM, um, if that. And for um, a blower door, it may be the difference of around 10 CFM uh, in terms of your reading. So it's nothing that's a, a major drastic um, uh, requirement if you're dealing with a 130, 140, or 1200 CFM. Um, you know, five plus or minus is not the end of the world. Um, I describe that, you know, we're, many of us are not going to Mars with uh, how we test uh, duct work or blower doors is the focus. So I think it's great to be very accurate and uh, precise. Uh, re repeatability is crucial, um, but I uh, firmly believe that our goal is to improve the performance of a structure, uh, not chase 3 CFM. Exactly. Colin, you want to add to that? Yeah. Colin, you good on that? Um, uh, uh, Probably a better way of thinking about it, uh, rather than CFM as percentages. So, a one percent error in the gauge is a one half percent error, 0 0.5 percent error in the flow measurement. So, you have to have a really big uh, gauge error. If you have a gauge error of uh, uh, 10 percent, it's about a four percent difference in flow. And uh, even the best flow measurement, the best flow measurement devices that we can get that cost thousands of dollars just to calibrate them are they're lucky to get them within half a percent so uh, you can see that flow measurement is much more difficult uh, much more difficult to get accuracy than uh, uh, gauge per, uh, gauge measurement is easy that's like super easy and I would say our gauges are always within a percent probably most of the time within 0.1 percent so um, it's really the fan itself that's uh, that is the source of error so 
Um, like that's why we have been focusing on fan accuracy because it's difficult and it's the big one. Uh, I wanted to comment on a, a bunch of questions that, that somebody had. If this is a good time, Joe, it's a little bit off topic, but uh, they're good questions. Uh, usually this is the point where we actually start to talk about questions. Um, Joe, do you think uh, the good time to sit to well, everybody know? Uh, yeah, sorry. yeah, I was like chatting away, blah, 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 because I was on mute. Um, <laughs> can you, uh, I want Jay to kind of just plug where we're going to be because this is kind of the hour that people kind of move past. And then we're going to do questions. Um, Tom's got several here I'm going to comment on. Um, I may not be here. Uh, I have to go do a training in the next room. So I'll let Jay plug where, where we're headed, and uh, you guys can take over the questions. And I appreciate everybody's time today. This is a great turnout. And uh, I can tell you this, that my relationship with RetroTech, which I, you know, where Jay and I are independent guys, started because I sent a few emails to Cullen. And he responded, usually that same day. And I sent him, like, a two-sentence question, and I got back three paragraphs, and sometimes even a phone call. So if you really want to learn more about this and want to find out what are the details, Colin would truly appreciate your emails. And uh, you know, sometimes he gets back to the same day, but usually within a week, and you'll be stunned at the in-depth knowledge that he'll gladly share with you. Thank you. Okay, Joel. Thanks.